I'd like to say I'm really extremely impressed and overwhelmed with the talent that I've observed here today. Uh, I think this bodes well for our future. Uh, your careers, um, the important discoveries uh, that you will make, uh, your inventions, I think will all uh, contribute a lot to our uh, better understanding of the world around us. So I wish you much success and I also satisfaction with your uh, career experience and your choices. So, uh, yes, I think I was asked to give this presentation because of my somewhat unusual Brookhaven work assignments away from the lab, uh, and in two cases outside of the United States. Although many uh, Brookhaven staff have work and education experiences outside of the country, few have done so as actual laboratory uh, employees, I would, I would guess. Uh, and I personally has, have found the experiences to be very enriching, uh, and uh, for my own personal satisfaction, but also I think it's, it's helped me professionally. So I will be talking about my experiences and give you even a little bit more background about me. And I hope that my stories will be of interest and might even help you examine your own situations and uh, think about how you want to navigate your futures. So how did I get here? Well. Shortly after I was born, I'll start that, 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 that far back, my father took a photo of me. I was about not even two months old. I was lying on my back like this. And he put a slide rule across my chest to take the picture. Uh, I'm not sure there was anything intentionally uh, prophetic in that gesture, but I think it's a good starting point for what my career has been. So let me ask, does, uh, does everyone know what a slide rule is? <laughs> I see some shaking. <laughs> so in the mid-50s, uh, when my father was an engineering student, that was one of the principal tools of engineering and science. And it was a way to do calculations very quick. It preceded the handheld calculator. Um, and uh, it was like, though it was a lot like uh, the, the smartphones are now. A lot of people are wearing smartphones on their belts. A lot of people back in the 50s uh, were wearing slide rules uh, on their belts as well. Um, so uh, I don't know if you know also the story of John Henry, the railroad man, but uh, that, the, the legend goes that his, his parents put a little hammer in his hand when he was a baby. So I was trained as an engineer, not as a scientist, as many of you. And uh, I moved um, around a lot. As I moved around a lot, it's interesting that I really didn't veer away from that occupation. And almost all my work experiences since my bachelor's have been in the application of technology or putting technology to work, not fundamental uh, discoveries. So, uh, so I've been standing on your shoulders, so to speak, your discoveries and your inventions that are so critical to making advances in technology and solving new problems or solving problems in new ways. Uh, so when I was growing up, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. But uh, after I took the college boards, uh, I had really good math scores. So people said, well, you ought to uh, you know, do something having to do with math. But I uh, was first a forestry student at the University of Tennessee, and my professor was, uh, a, well, a professor uh, hired me because I had good math stores. He was, a, he was a forest measurement expert. And in this job, I had to learn statistics and Fortran programming. And then again, this shows how old I am because in those days, each Fortran instruction had to be typed out on a punch card. Uh, and then the stack of cards is fed into a mainframe computer. And if there are a lot of other jobs in the queue, well, I had to go back uh, maybe the next day to see how things worked out. And in general, I had to try many, many times to make my program work. So I can't imagine uh, today, it's just so fast. Uh, and also, uh, in this job, my uh, professor, who is a very uh, forward-leaning kind of guy, he had one of the very first kind of PCs, uh, uh, personal computers, 
And, uh, but word processing programs did not exist. So um, I also programmed an early version of his computer, or his, his computer, to print out customized invitation letters, but I had to code every letter, line feed, uh, and carriage return to do it. Uh, so I loved the forestry, the biology, and the agriculture courses, but um, I, w I was interested in everything. I took advanced clothing construction, I took German, I took Latin etymology, piano, and modern dance, um, and then even later on, I took a bunch of other language courses. So, um, so to some of you, you might conclude that I was not very organized towards obtaining my degree, and you're right. Uh, but in looking back, I think these wide-ranging interests were instructive in understanding who I was. And at the time, I, did not, I didn't think about how these topics would come together. Um, and also at the time, uh, the courses at the uh, schools where I went were not as expensive as today. So um, I ended up uh, with a lot of extra credits, but uh, it didn't cost a lot more. Uh, another thing at that time I realized I really wanted to experience life in other countries, but I didn't really figure out then um, how to do that, at, say, as an exchange student. Um, but at the same time, um, I experienced a number of different cultures in my own country as I moved around as a child and then later as a young adult. Uh, so I uh, continued forestry, but then in Idaho, and I worked for a forest pathologist. And here I prepared a culture medium for wood decaying fungus, and I ran a large cumbersome statistical analysis program, a Fortran, of course. And this program was to try to uh, determine uh, possible external indicators of wood decaying disease. And so he had all these graduate students. One was a, a etymologist, one was um, a mycologist, another was looking at um, vascular plants and mosses. And uh, so we were trying to figure out whether the uh, appearance of any of these uh, other organisms could point to uh, f uh, decay uh, or other forested diseases. Also another fun part of this job was that um, I got to go with the team to do some destructive sampling in the forest and I, I strung uh, dynamite together with Primacord so we could put it around the stump of a tree to blast it out of the ground so then we could examine what was going on with the uh, tree roots and see how healthy they were. Uh, and then I also took some time to experience parts of the U.S. Uh, for example, I lived in Montana uh, in a cabin with no running water and wood heat and uh, wood stove. And I had to fetch water from the creek in the spring. And this ferocious bear, uh, mother bear with her baby bears were there in the spring. Um, and I also lived in a rustic setting like that in Tennessee. But, and I stayed uh, one summer on a farm in Kansas with an older couple who had survived the Dust Bowl days uh, and raised seven children. And the farmers in Northwest Kansas could no longer grow corn and turn to raising wheat and, and sheep. And here I learned to drive a tractor, which is not like driving a car. I learned to milk a cow and uh, some other things that I think um, all of these experiences probably helped me become a lot more self-reliant and confident. But finally, <laughs> when I was 21, I decided I, I had to get more serious about um, getting a good job, taking care of myself. And so I did a year of training at electronics uh, technician school, and then a two-year apprenticeship program at the Y-12 plant in Oak Ridge. This was an electrical apprentice. So this was really, really awesome because I learned to install metal conduit, including cutting and threading the pipes. I populated printed circuit boards. Uh, I worked in an instrument calibration lab. Uh, and I learned how to repair the numerical control machines that operated three, four, and five axis milling machines. And this was at a time when the numerical control systems were being computerized. 
uh, the original uh, numerical control machines were run off of punch tape. And one of the projects I got was to rewire the five-axis milling machine that had been used to make the box that held the moon rocks collected by, I guess, Neil Armstrong on his uh, walk on the moon. I hope I didn't screw up that machine. <laughs> I'd never, I, I left Y12 before I, I saw how, <laughs> whether it ran again. Um, so I, I loved working with my hands and building things, but I felt internal pressure to finish a college degree. My grandmother had wanted to go to college, and she always talked to us about what we wanted to be when we grew up and what we were going to study in college. Uh, but her father didn't let her attend college. And these conversations with her had a, a really strong impression on me. So I returned to university and graduated in electrical engineering, completed uh, a BS degree, and um, I then joined the Oak Ridge National Laboratory as an electrical engineer and finished my master's at night. Uh, I didn't get a PhD, but uh, sometimes I regret it, but in general, I think I've done okay. I've been happy. At Oak Ridge, uh, I worked on a variety of engineering tasks for a diverse customer base. And my later work involved uh, developing miniaturized gas sensors and some uh, research in gas sensor arrays. And, then as a res and this was as a result of a collaboration with a really talented scientist at Oak Ridge who, who collaborated with a lot of different people. He probably has um, a couple hundred patents or more, and, uh, but he, he was always uh, working with uh, different people and, and uh, enriching their lives too. He really enriched mine. The sensor work then led to a number of interesting speaking opportunities, and it made my background suitable for an assignment uh, managing a microsensor portfolio at the Department of Energy. This was the Office of uh, Nonproliferation R&D, which uh, it soon became after I joined the National, Security, uh, Na uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. So at that time, I was at Oak Ridge. But... Um, uh, and, and that, uh, that was uh, right before I met uh, someone who uh, helped me get to Brookhaven. Uh, and about that time, too, about the time that I ended up going to NNSA uh, to uh, be, uh, that was an off-site assignment for Oak Ridge, uh, I really decided that I was doing too many diverse things and I, I would like to concentrate in a mission area. And the two missions that I thought were compelling for me were energy efficiency and nonproliferation. And it turns out nonproliferation was the first thing that came uh, where the opportunity came for me. So now I'm getting to where I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the off-site assignments and what they were like. So I've had these two domestic assignments at the NNSA in Washington, one of them I'm doing right now. I just started officially yesterday. Um, the first one was uh, the nonproliferation non R&D, which is focused on uh, the more leading edge ideas and techniques for detecting and identifying evidence of nuclear material processing for the, atten for the intent of making nuclear weapons, um, and also for detecting and identifying production of nuclear weapons. Um, I got this job because my supervisor mentioned that this position was open and I immediately asked to be considered. Now I'm in a different NNSA office. This is the Nonproliferation and Arms Control International Safeguards, Safeguards Technology Team. And in this team, the portfolio of technologies under development are near, much nearer commercialization and they are largely targeted for use by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the part of the agency that inspects in the nuclear scientific medical facilities in more than 180 countries worldwide. Uh, and they are there to verify that nuclear material uh, and nuclear material act, uh, processing activities is for peaceful use only. So here, I think I need to define safeguards because I will mention a few more times. And we differentiate it from security, nuclear security, and nuclear safety. But say, to simplify the explanation, 
Nuclear safety is uh, uh, related to unintentional uh, consequences. Uh, you're not planning things that may uh, hurt people. Um, well, maybe any of them could hurt people, but it's really an unintentional situation. Nuclear security, I would say, is more about an intentional act, but it's usually uh, an, an insider uh, and, uh, or, or uh, an, an, an outsider, but a non-state actor. It's not the, company, uh, the country that's uh, doing it. They're, the country is the one being uh, attacked um, or uh, compromised. And then nuclear safeguards is about um, ensuring that countries themselves do not divert the, their nuclear materials or uh, establish nuclear activities that will uh, lead to de the development of nuclear weapons. And safeguards uh, is essentially a combination of techniques and protocols such as surveillance, nuclear measurements, inspections, sample taking, all these things that are applied to verify that, that nuclear material is for pe peaceful purposes only. Uh, I hope that helps explain uh, those situations. Um, when I went to DOE for the, my first offsite assignment, the, too, I had no idea what the environment of the office would be like. I don't even think I had ever visited DOE headquarters before. The hierarchy is very structured. I found that the people I worked for and uh, with at the headquarters are in general very talented and they work really hard. There are many deadlines, meetings, and unexpected and urgent tasks. The office managers uh, develop programs which are collections of tasks and activities that promote U.S. government objectives in the given area. And the composition and cost of these programs have to be extremely well coordinated within the department and they have to be defended during the congressional budget deliberations. So there is a constant pressure to maintain these programs. I think an earlier speaker talked about that, uh, one of the uh, chairs here at Brookhaven, that uh, maintaining good relationship with a, a DOE sponsor is really, really important. Uh, and if uh, your sponsor asks you to do something, you, you want to be very responsive to your sponsor because this, this means the health uh, and well-being of the programs at your uh, organization. Uh, so at DOE is probably staffed by a much higher percentage of political scientists, public administration experts, and international relations uh, uh, subject matter experts rather than purely technical staff, but there are, it's still a very technical organization. Um, so the number of federal slots is limited and uh, there are many technical people there, but they augment it by having uh, people like me go there to, uh, to advise them or work with them. And it's usually a rotation that doesn't last more than three years. And then generally the lab personnel selected for these jobs are subject matter experts that match the subject areas of the program office at DOE, the lab assignees, and some of them are um, uh, even more specialized. I'm, uh, as you can kind of tell, a fairly generalist, uh, but I have uh, had a lot of experience in the nonproliferation area, and I know a, a lot of what the IAEA is interested in. The lab assignees, though, are not allowed to make any funding decisions. They're not allowed to speak officially on behalf of the department. They help to manage the projects with the labs, universities, private sector, uh, through, uh, and this is, you know, email, phone, uh, formal and informal meetings, uh, and teleconferences. Uh, the, the lab people might draft reports, talking points, develop presentations, and uh, for various levels of audiences, and they review the technical proposals that come in and give opinions about the relative merit and chances for success. Then there are often quick turnaround assignments to produce uh, these briefing materials to respond to higher level management or to coordinate with other federal agencies and often provide answers to Congress and other oversight bodies. 
So being able to tailor the technical details for different kinds of audiences is very important. So I found, and in general, I find that Washington is a very busy place. Uh, so I want to say a little bit more about the group that I'm working in now. There are only four of us. The, there's a, a federal employee who's a PhD chemist. There's a, a guy from PNNL, a PhD physicist, I believe. There's a young uh, PhD, she just finished last year, I think. I think she's a biochemist, and myself. Our portfolio uh, subject areas are radiation measurement, destructive analysis of nuclear material samples, chain of custody tools such as seals, uh, video surveillance systems, new measurement techniques for isotopic identification and quantification, and uh, miniaturizing instruments for the field when possible. Instruments that stay put in these facilities, the IAEA instruments, have a target of 10 years or longer without failure because it's so expensive to go fix them or go replace things. So they, and they must uh, perform in harsh environments like there's heat, radiation, humidity, vibration, etc. cetera. Um, and also these, these uh, instruments that are uh, sitting there operating, often uh, the data is uh, sent back remotely to IAEA headquarters. Uh, so there has to be uh, this whole chain of custody of the data to make sure that it's not tampered with. They have to be able to authenticate it. Then there's some battery operated systems and then batteries are uh, a problem too. They're, ex they're expensive, they don't last long enough. So I was listening to one of the talks today about some ideas for batteries. So, you know, keep, keep working on that. <laughs> or are there ways we can do energy harvesting? We're looking at that too, so that we can extend the life of batteries in the field. Uh, then there's also the situation where uh, people, uh, uh, the inspectors go into facilities, they can't take in a smartphone, they can't take in a GPS system, they can't take in anything that has a, a wireless transmission. So in these very complicated facilities uh, where they might take samples, uh, take pictures with a dumb camera or have um, observations, uh, they need to be able to navigate around these facilities and figure out where they've been. So we're, in some cases, they were looking at autonomous uh, navigation, navigation, or I'm sorry, indoor navigation systems that don't rely on the typical tools that uh, we're, we've come to, uh, that we're used to on outside. Um, a starting point for the technology in this area, I should say, is uh, a technology readiness level that equates to the existence of a working prototype or a relevant uh, demonstration of a concept with commercial off-the-shelf uh, and other proven components. Uh, so I would just say, in general, for this kind of assignment, the uh, office directors at DOE are under constant pressure to demonstrate that their programs have merit accomplish their objectives, are aligned with national priorities, but uh, I have found it to be really rewarding for me to participate in this effort and see how it all gets put together, see how the laboratory products uh, get implemented, get uh, considered, uh, but then there are a lot of success stories too, so it's really, that's really rewarding. Then, uh, the other type of job, another type of job I've had is the liaison officer for the International Safeguards Project Office. This is an, uh, an office here at Brookhaven in the uh, National Security, or Nonproliferation National Security Department. And uh, this group, I'm going to call it ISPO, performs technical and administrative management of tasks that are funded by the U.S. support program for IAEA safeguards. This is a program that's funded out of the State Department. And this is a 40-year-old program that I think, um, I, in general, I think it was conceived by a state and Brookhaven people. And uh, also it was given a good push by the former Senator John Glenn, and who was you know, also a former astronaut. He was, he was the one, I think, who was given credit for getting this program started. A 40-year program that's pretty, pretty impressive, I think, for Brookhaven to have uh, this going on. 
Um, so getting back to uh, this, the IAEA, again, we're supporting the International Atomic Energy Agency. The Department of Safeguards and the agency in general, it does not have uh, the resources, financial or human, to conduct a lot of its own R&D, the kind of R&D that's very expensive and uh, to produce the kinds of tools and capabilities that the inspectors need. So uh, the nuclear R&D capabilities of the U.S. National Lab, some of the private sector organizations are brought to bear on uh, the IAEA's nuclear verification needs. And the tasks that ISPO uh, generally uh, manages can be broadly characterized as tools and methods, cost-free experts. We provide a number of experts over at the IAEA and uh, also training. And uh, most of the uh, U.S. support program training takes place at the labs in the U.S. For example, all of the inspectors undergo a two-week non-destructive assay training at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And then there are about 19 other countries and the European Union that also have similar programs that provide uh, support for the IAEA Department of Safeguards. But um, the, the U.S. program is is the oldest and uh, the largest. That's not to undercut what these other countries do. It's really important that there is uh, contributions from as many countries as possible. <clears throat> the, another um, function uh, is to help Americans applying for IAEA positions. The U.S. government pays about a quarter of the IAEA's budget but only about 11 to 12 percent of its staff are Americans. Uh, so we would like to increase that uh, to a higher level. And most of the jobs that people are looking for are very technical. And I've uh, talked to a lot of Americans and non-Americans about how, uh, how best to position themselves for their uh, in applications. And uh, also um, to try to get more American inspectors uh, in the IAEA. So I learned about this position when I was on assignment in Washington from a former ISPO staff member. And uh, uh, the position um, of the liaison officer, this part of ISPO, but it's physically in Austria where the IAEA is. And uh, of course, you know, because I really wanted to experience life outside the US, this is something that was very compelling for me. So I immediately said, uh, I found out that this guy was going to go rotate as the liaison officer to Vienna. And so I said to him, that's the job I want when you rotate back to the US. So I cannot tell you how happy I was and still am that I was selected to follow him. And I was fortunate to be able to serve in that position two different times. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit more about this um, the U.S. mission where this liaison officer job is. It's in a U.S. diplomatic office. There are about 35 people there, and it's also headed by an ambassador normally, but there's no ambassador there yet. Uh, and it's quite different than being the U.S. ambassador to Austria. This job is the ambassador to the international organizations in Vienna, of which the IAEA is one of the larger organizations. And the staff in the mission are uh, mostly U.S. Foreign uh, Service officers from the Department of State. And there are a few civil service uh, State Department employees. There are three U.S. Department of Energy attaches, one for nuclear safeguards, one for nuclear energy, and one for nuclear security. There's also a staff member from NRC for nuclear safety. And uh, typically, the Foreign Service officers are heavily steeped in policy, international relations, and many speak two or more languages fluently. They might have military experience, and many have degrees in business, finance, law, and some science and technology disciplines. But, um, and virtually all of the posts uh, turn over every two or three years. So institutional knowledge uh, can be a problem, but I've been really impressed with a Foreign Service culture that is trained to ramp up very quickly at a new post. Uh, then uh, having a team uh, with a diverse background is an obvious advantage when many of the issues have a technology, these 
policy issues, U.S. policy issues have a technology component or dom dominated sometimes by technology issues. And the U.S. mission leans heavily on the guidance from the Departments of Energy, State, the uh, NRC, and DOD. The uh, U.S. mission in Vienna uh, has a team dedicated to the IAEA, so the ISPA liaison officer is part of that team. And uh, they interact constantly with uh, the IAEA. The ISPO liaison officer is really concentrating on the, the task that the ISPO group manages. But often, because uh, it's a small office, uh, and the rule at a US diplomatic post is that everyone works for the ambassador. So sometimes you get roped into other assignments that are not uh, your routine job. Uh, but here again, the messaging is really, really important. You want something that reflects, um, a tech if you're talking about technology, but you're going to be uh, including as part of a U.S. policy position, you want the message to be really accurate and correct. So uh, we all get to participate in uh, those kinds of exercises. It's, it's really uh, very important. Uh, Um, excuse me. <laughs> and here again, it's very interesting for me to see how technology and diplomacy can work together. And there are some very, very talented people that bridge across these two areas. And, uh, and you see how important it is for uh, making, uh, for, for the U.S. to be successful in its uh, diplomatic objectives. Then uh, my third um, kind of position off-site from Brookhaven, in fact, I've been a Brookhaven employee for 15 years, but I've only physically been here about three and a half. Uh, but uh, I hope that hasn't been terrible for the lab. It's been fabulous for me to be living in Austria, living in Japan. So my third position was at the Japan Atomic Energy Agency as an invited engineer. And uh, I'll, I'm going to call it JAEA. Uh, uh, is Japan's version of the Department of Energy Laboratories. JAEA built and ran Japan's uh, research and experimental reactors, the experimental nuclear material processing facilities, including you know, enrichment, reprocessing, nuclear fuel fabrication. It also, as many of you probably know, it has high energy physics experiments that are run as user facilities in a similar way to uh, Brookhaven. I worked in a nonproliferation group, and uh, again, I met my predecessor at a, a professional meeting. He's from Sandia National Laboratories, and uh, I wanted to know what he was doing in Japan, and he mentioned that he, would, he was working at JAEA, and he did this and that, and he would be returning uh, to Sandia at some point. And I said, that's the job I want when you rotate back to Sandia. And he, he gave me a kind of funny look because only Sandia uh, employees had ever been in that post before. But uh, when it came time to replace him, nobody at Sandia wanted to go. And uh, because I had in a previous short-term assignment at DOE worked for the guy who was the manager of the program and helped him, uh, he knew me, and that helped, I think, uh, make it possible for me to be selected. So, uh, as you might expect, the working environment at JAEA is very hierarchical, but that's, um, and, but that's okay. And again, it's, it's, again it's, it's important to get the messages right, get, have the bottom know what the top's trying to do, and the top know what's bottom's try, what, the, what the bottom's doing. So um, I came to appreciate that, that some structure is really, really important. Uh, and the JAEA staff that I work with are all scientists and engineers. They rotate in their jobs about every two or three years. And often they're separated from their families because the JAEA facilities are all over Japan. Uh, and they do have an office in Washington and an office in Vienna, too. Um, 
so uh, this gives them a, a very well-rounded understanding of their capabilities and their technologies. At some point, I think some people are allowed to specialize and stay put. Uh, my work at the JEA was to conduct research, and I hadn't done any research in 10 years. So this was really mentally kind of hard for me at first. And uh, I had to develop a thesis, and, but it still had to be related to JAEA's mission and be in line sufficiently with uh, JAEA staff members' area of responsibilities because they don't just let foreigners go off and do stuff. Um, that it, I have to have a minder. Um, but I, I really, really love my colleagues. I, I got along with them really well, so it wasn't a problem. So I struggled with this for a while before I reached out to some people that I knew um, outside of JAEA and I asked for some brainstorming ideas and, so, and this worked. It's a good lesson, you know, ask for help. <laughs> when you think you need help, ask for help. Um, so uh, my project was still more of a paper study, but it was an analysis of the impact of advanced technologies on both the inspectors and the facility operators. Because, uh, you know, it's one thing to help the inspectors do their job better, but sometimes this can be at a disadvantage to the operators who have to stop what they're doing to let the inspectors in and poke around. So, um, but I did get to interview a number of the facility operators in Japan, and I, I really learned an, an awful lot. And, I, and uh, the IAEA was not very forthcoming in information, so I had to look online and look for papers and dig out information. Um, but I did have an IAEA person review my paper before I published it. Um, and I did some other things at JAEA too. I worked on some other projects, and uh, I was also asked many times to help uh, edit the English for their publications and their presentations. Or sometimes I would write the talking points for Japanese managers who were opening a meeting and wanted to welcome uh, foreign uh, people there at the international meetings. And that was a lot of fun too, and especially when I was looking at their papers because I learned a lot more about what they were trying to do and uh, a lot of times I'd have questions because I thought well, something sounded off, but actually it was because I didn't, know, uh, I didn't know that subject area that well, but they helped me understand. So I learned uh, so much, and I'm really grateful to the Japanese colleagues for their patience and their generosity because living in Japan was much more difficult than living in Austria. Um, but uh, I, I thought living in Japan was such a... A fabulous experience. Uh, we traveled a lot, we hiked a lot, and uh, we had uh, a really, really um, interesting time. And now uh, I'm at the end. <laughs> I can't get back to my... Um, so I would just want to say in, in finishing up, my career has been marked, as you've seen, by a number of transitions, by maybe a, a few little blind dialies, testing, trying things out. Um, but uh, I see that still, I, I'm interest, still interested in everything, but I'm, I don't have the focus to be an expert in anything. <laughs> um, I'm restless uh, in a sense, I enjoyed moving around, and maybe that's a virtue because some people like staying put, and so it's good, some people need to be flexible, I think. Um, and I like working with my hands and solving puzzles, and I think in the, my more recent jobs, the puzzles have been how do I, uh, work well in this organization, this culture is different than the culture I was working in before. Not just the country that I'm in, but actually the organizational culture can be quite different. And uh, I think to be successful you have to figure that out too. So uh, I, I see that I've eaten up all the time and I didn't think that I would do that. <laughs> but uh, thank you for your attention. Um, 
Actually, right now, uh, for example, at DOE, my uh, supervisor, the chemist, um, I've known her a little bit on and off, um, but she's been fantastic. She's been fantastic um, and very easy to work with. Uh, when I moved to Japan, of course, it was a black box to me. But um, I had a colleague, they gave her the day off, she showed us around, she took us shopping, um, another person had an apartment to rent, so we rented his apartment, and a lot of things came together for us in very short order. Um, so, uh, and every time I had questions there, they helped me. Um, and uh, in Austria, it's not so hard anymore to get around as an English-speaking person. And uh, because I had been there before, the second time was easy. The first time was a, a little bit, but um, it wasn't so, it, it really wasn't so difficult. But at the time, um, most of the time the State Department people have a sponsor, but for whatever reason, ISPO doesn't generally have a sponsor, but the person before me, the ISPO person is supposed to, to help. Um, but sometimes that doesn't always work out either. I think the first time, yes, uh, my ISPO uh, predecessor was, was pretty helpful. Yeah, so it's getting started, and then you just have to, yeah. I, I, there were times, I'd say, the first time I was in Austria uh, working at the mission, the culture seemed so, uh, in the mission, the mission culture was so different uh, that there were days I was discouraged. I was thinking, ah, how can I deal with these people? But little by little, you figure it out, and um, yeah, there, it, you find out that it's really not, it, it's, it's just a matter of learning. Just like any other difficult uh, te uh, technical problem, you know, I, uh, you just kind of keep working at it. <laughs> and then finally you understand. <laughs> yeah.